is a big honor for us. So I'm going to ask uh, Emma to introduce the group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're the seniors from Mount Madonna School in California, and this is our Values and World Thought program. So our project that we're here for is called Vidya Dharma. So we've come to India to gain a greater understanding about ourselves and our worlds. And we do have questions prepared for you, but if you have any opening comments you'd like to make, we'd be happy to hear them. <laughs> First of all, uh, welcome to Dharamshala. And uh, also welcome your interest in uh, Dharma, also in Tibetan affairs. Uh, Dharamshala is a bit difficult place. Uh, there might be a lot of inconveniences. Mm, but in spite of that, you choose to come. Uh, that shows your deep interest. So that's all. You can go to your questions. I will try. Mm. Hello, my name is Hello. Susie. Mm. Um, yesterday, His Holiness told us that the purpose of education is to reduce the gap between perception and reality, or to move towards the truth. We were wondering what your views are on education in relation to finding the truth. Uh, my view is uh, not different from His Holiness's view. Um, <coughs> actually, the um, Buddhist concept of uh, education, we do not uh, differentiate education and training. Training and education is one or the same. To train the mind through a discipline in order to uh, awake the inner intelligence of the individuals. The wisdom is uh, inbuilt. The wisdom is of the individual uh, quality. But uh, that quality is being uh, covered by uh, so many different uh, conditionings and that's why he or she is uh, unable to uh, use the inner intelligence or inner wisdom to uh, discriminating the right and wrong. And uh, the purpose of education is uh, to free uh, the wisdom of the mind from those conditioning. My late friend, you might have heard, Jiddu Krishnamurti used to say, Education means awakening of inner intelligence so that the person can flower in goodness. Once your uh, intelligence is awakened, then you become free. And that means you have a free judgment of the right and wrong uh, for yourself. And therefore, you always do the good and you are flowering the goodness. So this is um, my viewpoint of the education and particularly the Buddha said that you need a, a discipline, moral court, and uh, then thereafter you need a concentrated mind. If you have a certain degree of moral discipline and you have a concentrated mindset, then you will <coughs> able to awake your wisdom. And then after awakening up your wisdom, then the truth is before you, the things are clear for you. Okay. Hi, Willie. Hi. When asked about progress and the achievements of the West, you have been quoted as saying, what we have achieved is the amplification and enlargement of our vices. Is it possible to achieve intellectual and material progress without the enlargement of vices? Uh, that all depends what you uh, define <coughs> progress and the development. And uh, the uh, Western uh, concept of progress and uh, the ancient and uh, Eastern concept of progress is uh, uh, altogether different. So uh, if uh, your concept or your definition of progress is uh, to increase uh, the satisfaction of uh, uh, sensory mind, then uh, in that matter, I don't think uh, the progress 
go alone without any voices. And because uh, the Western model of progress is the exploitation of human greed. And uh, you exploit human greed and therefore you forgot uh, the human needs. And uh, you are unable to uh, differentiate between the need and uh, the greed. And uh, all your needs have been taught uh, by the producers. And uh, you have no freedom to understand what is really your need and uh, uh, what is just uh, imposed upon you uh, as an uh, object of greed. So therefore, if the progress is only for the uh, satisfaction of uh, sensory mind, then uh, you always uh, try to uh, exploit the uh, human greed. Actually, uh, if you look to the human history for the last uh, around 250 or 300 years, then uh, the, 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 the uh, humanity become so-called uh, industrialized. And the direct result of industrialization is uh, to produce goods much more than the requirement, the need. Then uh, these producers have to find a market. And uh, they very uh, uh, cleverly uh, understood that human greed can be uh, exploited very easily. So they exploited human greed and then they need more and more and more unendingly. Actually, the purpose of shoe is to protect the uh, feet when you walk around. Uh, but then we, our greed has been exploited, we forgot the purpose of shoe, then we pay more attention about the color, about the shape, about the design. And then uh, you need uh, one shoe for uh, morning <coughs> work and uh, another one for bathroom and third is for office and the fourth is uh, uh, for another game and uh, for jogging and for hiking. So you will need uh, more than a dozen pairs of shoe for your only one pair of feet. <laughs> 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 then that is also coined with uh, comparison and competition. Comparison and a competition, wherever is a competition, there is vices. Because uh, one has to uh, look for one's own victory and the other's uh, defeat. So that is uh, all, uh, 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 from that attitude, all kind of vices are being produced. <laughs> Hi. 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 Mm -hmm. Uh, what aspects of your time as Prime Minister have been most rewarding and which aspects have been most challenging? <laughs> First of all, the um, correct designation of my post is uh, the chairperson of the Kashak. We never designate as a Prime Minister, but uh, in English language, Prime Minister can be used. So I worked uh, in this uh, office for the last uh, almost 10 years. And uh, I'm by nature a very uh, forget, a forgetful person. I cannot remember things. So the things come and went. Uh, I do not remember what was the biggest challenge and what, what was the uh, most happy occasion. But during my tenure, <coughs> I was able to uh, do few things which was of uh, my liking and uh, uh, my own, uh, which, uh, which, uh, which represents my own uh, uh, concepts and ideas. Uh, one was the uh, basic education policy. Of course, it was... Uh, adopted by the parliament, uh, but the uh, draft was uh, uh, of uh, uh, my uh, contribution and uh, in which uh, I was able to uh, uh, spell in detail uh, what is education and what is the purpose of education, what is the expectations from the education, and uh, then particularly for the Tibetans in uh, SL, <coughs> what kind of education need for them. <coughs> so if you're interested, you may have that uh, document from the Department of Education, and it is uh, 
translated into English. <coughs> uh, that gives me uh, satisfaction. Of course, uh, it is difficult to implement uh, in totality, but uh, we are able to make some kind of uh, um, <coughs> contribution. <coughs> then I was able to uh, uh, legalize all our activities and um, particularly the uh, financial resources and the financial uh, management of the Central Tibetan Administration and uh, for all the Tibetan settlements. Uh, we are able to uh, uh, make them completely uh, transparent, legal, and uh, also um, moral. So all uh, projects, developmental projects and uh, other things, uh, we have put four cross-cutting criteria before accepting any um, work or project, <coughs> we have to examine uh, from these four criteria. The first is uh, no violence, whether any work or project uh, which uh, will cause directly or indirectly any kind of violence. That was the first uh, criteria. And the uh, uh, second criteria is uh, eco-friendly any work or project, if we undertake, will it directly or indirectly cause harm to the environment and the ecosystem. And uh, the third is uh, sustainability. There are many things which are um, uh, temporarily very profitable, but uh, they are not uh, sustainable. And uh, we also look for sustainability. And the fourth is uh, the output, the benefit uh, should reach to the poorest of the poor. So through these four uh, cross-cutting criteria, we undertake all the development projects for the Tibetan settlements and the Tibetan diaspora. So these are um, uh, something which we are uh, able to uh, uh, incorporate in our uh, uh, working uh, system, uh, some kind of moral-based uh, principles. And then uh, my um, effort was uh, to convert all the uh, um, agriculture settlements for organic. These are the few things which uh, uh, I can remember with uh, happiness. Then, of course, the biggest challenge is uh, to, to engage the PRC leadership and uh, in that front, I was able to uh, conduct nine rounds of uh, dialogue with the PRC leadership. And uh, we are also able to uh, reach a kind of logical conclusion of our engagement with them by submitting a very comprehensive memorandum, memorandum for uh, <coughs> general autonomy to all Tibetan people. And uh, uh, that memorandum is now public domain in the public domain. And uh, then uh, this memorandum was uh, uh, misinterpreted by uh, PRC uh, uh, people. And again, we are able to uh, give them a clarification note. So that is also in the public domain. So now they will not be able to uh, blame us or blame His Holiness uh, that we are seeking separation or independence. So these two documents, uh, uh, explained very um, clearly and in detail what autonomy, His Holiness and Tibetans in this for is uh, looking for. So this, it is a challenge, but at the same time, uh, we are able to uh, uh, achieve something out of that. Okay? Hi, I'm PK. Yeah. And uh, yeah. you once said in reference to China's actions toward Tibet, that the so-called civilized community is unable to stop them, condemn them. We are unable to prevent such action from happening. <clears throat> Sometimes I have a tendency to lose faith in humanity. So for me to hear someone of your stature say that at times they start to feel that they're losing 
faith and humanity does frighten me a little bit. So I was wondering how you um, keep going under those circumstances and also if you still believe there's a realistic way to change China's policies towards Tibet. We cannot uh, completely lose uh, faith in humanity as long as we have faith in truth. Human community is uh, survived on the basis of uh, truth, so therefore we have to keep uh, faith in humanity. But at many times, particularly in the uh, so-called uh, modern civilized world, <coughs> people go by convenience and uh, they do not uh, care what injustice and what wrong things are happening around to them. Um, I was reading the newspaper a few years back and uh, a heading, very appropriate heading which starts my mind and that heading says, never mind human rights, money matters. <laughs> and uh, this uh, speaks the uh, mindset of the uh, um, mindset of the uh, modern leadership of the nations. They are very good people in the grassroots, but uh, the leadership who matters, who uh, have the power to uh, uh, things to be done, they are only looking for uh, trade and economic gain. The totalitarian dictatorship of Beijing could not have been survived for such a long time until now, particularly after the disintegration of Soviet Union. China should have followed that pattern, but China survived until today and they are still planning for many hundred years to come to survive that kind of totalitarian region and uh, not caring for individual rights, individual freedom and the violation of human rights will continue because uh, China is considered to be a good market and uh, the market should be used and uh, we should not interfere what China is doing for their people. So this attitude is uh, very, uh, uh, very disturbing, very disheartening. In the beginning, there was a theory, uh, perhaps it was uh, invented and developed by uh, Dr. Kissinger, economic liberalization will uh, bring automatically political liberalization and uh, we must help China to uh, uh, grow, uh, to develop economically and uh, we need not to do anything for political liberalization. But uh, for the last uh, 40 years, China did develop economically, they become completely market oriented um, capital, capitalism, there is no more communism in China, but only the governmental machinery remains in few persons' hand and uh, that is cruel and that is uh, uh, unsympathetic uh, to uh, people and uh, the people of China has suffered a great deal. And uh, the Tiananmen Square massacre was uh, one of the, uh, one of the unique thing happened in uh, human history. And uh, the people uh, around the world uh, not able to uh, stop them for this kind of massacring. And uh, even today, for the last uh, three weeks, we are crying everywhere to save the Ngapakirti monastery from complete destruction. Uh, but uh, nothing had happened. Three people died, uh, killed, and 300 monks have been uh, uh, arrested and disappeared and the rest of the uh, monastery was uh, completely cut off and they are uh, 
um, short of uh, food articles, drinking water, everything. So this kind of torture in the 21st century, which is uh, uh, happening in front of the uh, world community, but uh, there's no nation, there's no organization, there's no association, there's no individual who can intervene and uh, save the people who are suffering. So this is a fact we have to, uh, uh, we have to accept. The, <coughs> the public will, the people's uh, inspiration uh, do not work all the times. Uh, if we look back a few years before the Iraq war, in America, in Europe and everywhere, the public opinion was so strong against that war and the people tried their level best. Millions of people come out on the streets, but ultimately the people could not stop that. So very few people, uh, the power lies in their hand and then uh, the violence, destruction, uh, exploitation, all these things are happening there. So we shall have to uh, accept this reality and we shall have to think how to uh, change this reality. Otherwise, the humanity may not be uh, able to survive for a long time. So it's a serious, serious question, serious matter. Each one has to think about it. That was my intention. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Emma. And regarding the nature of real knowledge, you said, the real knowledge of the thing is not subject to development. It is fully there from the time of its revelation, and it might be transmitted down to a certain point in the lineage, but then it begins to deteriorate. How can we maintain the true knowledge of the thing and prevent its deterioration? If you achieve the perception of the truth, then there will not be possibility of deterioration. But uh, you do not have the perception of the truth. Your knowledge is uh, in the realm of thought then uh, there is a danger of uh, deteriorating because uh, all the thought processes are limited. They are conditioned. And the thought does not uh, touch directly with the reality, with the truth. And thought only touches to the image of the truth. And when the thought trust to the image of truth, a person shall have to do continuous effort to uh, get through the image and reach to the real thing. And once you reach to the real thing, then your knowledge is uh, permanent, durable, and it can only grow, it cannot be deteriorated. So, the process of learning, process of education is uh, to reach to that, that level, direct contact with the uh, reality. Hi, my name is Noah and uh, you already touched on this a little bit, but we saw in an interview with uh, Donovan Robert, you said the human mind is completely conditioned. We need to move beyond these limitations of our conditioning and realize that our instruments are limited and that our minds can only go so far. How do you think we can move past this conditioning and limitation of our minds? I have no um, ready-made uh, method or technology. Each individual shall have to find that. First of all, you should not take uh, my words uh, as it is uh, for granted. This is only expression of uh, 
my view. And uh, you need to examine it, whether, uh, which I have said, is uh, with the reality or uh, it is just my imaginary. Unless you examine it for yourself, uh, you can be carried away. If you uh, accept my words, and uh, then you will also be uh, uh, accept some other person's word, which might say completely opposite of which I have said. So both of these are not your knowledge. You are just uh, uh, depend on borrowed informations. So in the Buddhist learning process, uh, we say three stages. The first is hearing, the second is a contemplation, and the third is a meditation. Hearing means reading books or uh, learning from the teacher. You just, uh, uh, you just uh, accumulate the information. Then after accumulation of that information, then contemplation means you have to examine it for yourself whether this information is uh, correct according to uh, my analysis or it is false. When you find it is correct or it is false for yourself, then the not knowledge become your own. And until that knowledge is borrowed one, just information one. Then thereafter you concentrate on uh, such thing which you discovered and uh, then your concentration, your meditation leads you to a direct perception of <coughs> that reality. And then you, you can say, I know it, I see it. So conditioning of mind, how to uh, <coughs> get out of this conditioning, I think uh, the only way is uh, seriously and uh, uh, forcefully observe the, uh, the uh, forces and activities of the mind, particularly the thought. The thought goes uh, without any watch. If you have a, a watch, you have an observation to the process of your thought then you will able to uh, see, you will able to listen, and uh, you will able to uh, touch <coughs> without interference of the thought. And uh, you will able to reach to the uh, object by yourself without the judgment of or without the uh, naming of by the thought process. So, uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti used to say that the truth is a uh, pathless island and uh, you shall have to find for yourself how to reach there. So, only uh, uh, outsider or any different individual only can say, see, observe, to become introwardly. And uh, if you are able to uh, silently, <coughs> undisturbingly able to see the thought process and the operation of your mind, only then you will be able to see the conditioning or the limitation. Once you see that limitation, then I think you need not any separate effort to uh, overcome it. Seeing itself is the antidote of the limitation. Hi, my name is Chelsea. You said the seed of virtuous conduct is required for one's own development and also for the establishment of social harmony. 
Can you talk about the <coughs> process of how virtue works for our self-development? <coughs> virtue and vices sometimes it is uh, uh, it differ from place to place, time to time. Uh, it is relative to uh, uh, time and space, number of things. But the basic virtue, the basic goodness, I think the nature uh, that is always uh, unchanging. It does not uh, depend on time or uh, place or space, whatever it may be. It is uh, uh, everlasting truth. So, if you are able to uh, discover that inner goodness of yourself, then uh, you automatically become yourself a virtuous person. And a virtuous person relates with the uh, community or with the society, then uh, a harmonious society becomes uh, possible. Without uh, uh, awakening the basic goodness, simply um, trying to uh, achieve a harmonious society might become an imposed harmonious, imposed by law or imposed by social behavior or imposed by uh, uh, local conditions, customs. This kind of harmonious uh, living or harmonious society uh, is uh, temporary, uh, superficial, which can be disturbed uh, so easily. I think uh, today, the modern world, uh, we have a lot of conflicts and uh, confrontations because we do not have a, a real harmonious living because we have lost the uh, uh, real goodness of all the individuals. So in a short, I might say that uh, understanding of self is the key uh, to awake the goodness. Uh, if you forcibly observe yourself, as we conceive a very uh, strong monolithic self, somebody calls your name and your immediate reaction is, I am, I am here. And somebody praise you, you become uh, very proud. Or somebody abuse you, you become very um, uh, anger, uh, annoyed. And at that time, on which you are um, thinking of yourself is not the real self. It is just an imaginative and imposed, imposed self. So that is a hindrance of not knowing the self. Why the Buddhist people talk about the selflessness of the Niratma? It does not mean a nihilation, an individual do not exist we do not talk about that. And uh, even the uh, other religious tradition, the Hindus and the Jains, they talk about uh, the soul, Atma. And uh, the Buddhists talk about the soullessness. It appears to be talking opposite things, but actually they are not talking opposite things. Both of them saying that you are not uh, realizing, you are not seeing the soul or the yourself, the real self. 
So, you are just imaginating some uh, different self which is uh, uh, just uh, 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 thrown upon you and which covers all your uh, uh, inner, um, inner wisdom, inner intelligence. So, you have to remove this uh, cover and then uh, see the interdependently originated and changing, ever changing self. Uh, perhaps this is a bit technical word. <laughs> Everything exists there interdependently. So, self is also an interdependent nature. That interdependent uh, and the ever changing self, you are able to see that, then uh, uh, the your inner goodness will uh, uh, come out and uh, then you are able to uh, build a very harmonious uh, society around you. Sorry, I'm too long. <laughs> Is it difficult to? <laughs> That's a, uh, no, it's a beautiful discourse and we'll what we'll do is we can think on it, reflect on it, right, right. So yes. after yes. some time. Hi, my name is Lindsay. We found a quote from you about the three conditions for something to be considered an authentic tradition. One, being taught by an authentic or divine source. Two, transmitted by means of an unbroken lineage. And three, verifiable through common sense and self-knowledge. Yesterday we spoke with His Holiness and he told us that common experience and common sense are important in creating ge genuine universal values. Do you think authentic traditions always carry universal values? I think so. I would say yes. Tradition is a, a term which refers to a very different or very uh, unique uh, um, um, continuity. But today we use the tradition for all kind of uh, perpetuated customs or habits. Perpetuated, long term perpetuated custom habit doesn't become a tradition. For example, in uh, India, there's a long time perpetuated uh, caste discrimination. And uh, this caste di discrimination is not a, a part of uh, Indian spirituality. It is not a tradition, but it is uh, a bad uh, system which has been uh, perpetuated for a long time. So, tradition means, firstly, it must uh, originate from an uh, authentic source. Uh, if uh, in the Christian terminology, it may say from divine source. Authentic source means a source which have a knowledge, which have the perception of truth. Only that uh, source can uh, create in tradition. And then that teaching comes from lineage, unbroken lineage. Buddha taught to his direct disciples and his direct disciples to taught their own direct disciples. And uh, we can recount for the last 200, 2,500 years of the uh, teaching lineage of the Buddha until now. So, it is coming about, um, through this kind of lineage. Then, similarly, um, it needs to be verifiable scientifically or by common sense or by logic it is illogical or it is uh, scientifically wrong, then we can't, uh, uh, we can't think it as a, a tradition. So, all the tradition, if you reach the real tradition, it may be Christianity, it may be Muslim, it may be Hinduism, it may be Buddhism. The real tradition is always talking about a universal value. But then these traditions are gradually disappeared and many other uh, outside 
uh, alterations and uh, things that come. Then uh, today we are considering many things as a tradition of some religion or some society. They are not tradition. They are not uh, talking about universal uh, uh, value. Universal value means a value which can be known by any person without depending on entering into a faith of certain religion. Uh, um, atheist or non-believer, non-believers can also verify a universal value because the value is universal then that is uh, uh, knowable and uh, acceptable to should be acceptable to everyone so that's yeah uh, hi. hi as the next yeah. generation coming forward do you have any advice you'd like to give us no <laughs> <laughs> many people uh, ask me to give advice so i always say i'm, I'm not an advisor <laughs> um, advice will uh, do not work. Advice sometimes uh, can mislead you. Uh, you are energetic uh, young person and you have all the uh, uh, necessary conditions facilities and the ability to know the truth for yourself, to find your way by your own wisdom and, uh, and uh, that wisdom will be authentic to you. It may not be authentic for everybody, but it will be authentic to you. So therefore, you should not depend on advises, you should depend on your own wisdom and for that you have to work hard. To seek advice is easy, easy going job. <laughs> <laughs> to find the truth by yourself, that is a little uh, uh, difficult and you have to work hard and uh, uh, continuously and then you will find it. Thank you very much. Thank that you. is wonderful. Thank you so much. You can think about what he said for the next 10 years, okay? <laughs>